Hello there and many thanks for joining us in this fresh edition of Business Week, the program that brings you top business stories that made the headlines during the course of this week, including special news features, market data, interviews and much more. Welcome to the show. Well, here are some of the biggest stories that we've tracked for you over the course of this week. Now on the local front. Nigeria's Naira rose slightly against the US dollar at the official market by midweek, a day after the currency slumped to a record low at the spot market. The currency strengthened to 430 Naira per dollar on Wednesday from the 431 Naira it traded at the NAFEX window in the previous session. Now at the parallel market, the currency weakened to about 710 uh, Naira per dollar amidst the shortfall in foreign exchange supply as demand increases. The International Monetary Fund has also urged Nigeria and other sub-Saharan African countries currently experiencing high external debt to take proactive measures to enable them escape debt default. In its World Economic Outlook for this month, it puts Nigeria's growth for 2023 at 3.2% and in its outlook as well, it's also retaining Nigeria's growth projections at 3.4% for this year. And now the Federation Account Allocation Committee says it has disbursed a total of 802.4 billion naira to the three tiers of government last month. And according to the statement by FAC, the federal, state and local government shared uh, allocation for the month of June increased by 18%. And that's an increase from 602 billion naira it had disbursed earlier in the month of May. On the international front now, Australian inflation spared to a 21-year high last quarter and is likely to accelerate even further as food and energy costs explode. Stoking speculation, interest rates will need to be more than double to bring the outbreak under control. Data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics show that the consumer price index jumped 1.8% in the June quarter, just short of market forecast of about 1.9%. And the Federal Reserve, in its latest move, also says that it would not flinch in its battle against the most intense breakout of inflation in the United States since the 1980s, even if that means a sustained period of economic weakness and a slowing jobs market. The 75 basis point rate increase announced by the Fed, coupled with earlier actions in the month of March, May and June, have now jacked the central bank's overnight interest rate from near zero to a level between 2.25 and 2.5%. In a similar vein now, HSBC Holdings in a fresh move also says that it will leave its best lending rate in Hong Kong and change at 5% despite a rise in the base rate of the city's central bank charged through its overnight discount window. The Hong Kong Monetary Authority raised the rate by 75 basis points to 2.75% hours after the US Federal Reserve delivered a rate hike of the same size, Hong Kong tracks U.S. interest rate moves because its currency is also pegged to the U.S. dollar. Although banks in the global financial hub have some leeway to lag U.S. moves when setting prime rates. Well, it's now time to bring you some special packages prepared by our correspondents. The scarcity and rising cost of the aviation fuel, popularly called Jet A1, has hit the nation's aviation industry hard. This has pushed up prices of air tickets by over a hundred percent this year as the cost of air travel continues to rise. Airline operators are worried that the cost of the aviation fuel, which was 180 naira per litre at the start of the year, is now about 1,000 naira per litre. Another issue of concern for them is scarcity and rising cost of forex, which is needed for most transactions in the industry. Bro. The development prompted this closed-door meeting between the operators and the aviation authorities. The outcome of the talks revealed plans by the aviation authorities to meet with relevant agencies on addressing these issues. We sat today as a family um, to discuss, uh, to agree on, uh, on what to do and also to approach um, the entities that are responsible for this so that collectively we can save the sector. The minister rules out the possibility of a bailout, which he feels is unnecessary at the moment. I remember there was 10,000 uh, metric ton 
of the product was given to the airline. That helped at a controlled price. Control meaning that the landing uh, price plus their cost and a bit of margin. The operators say they are satisfied with existing efforts by the authorities to address their concerns and hope that lasting solutions would be found in tackling setbacks that make staying in business difficult. We are pleased with the approach um, government is trying to adopt to tackle these issues. Not just um, a fire brigade approach, but to see that this thing is done um, you know, for, the long, for the long run. The airlines have consistently sought urgent intervention by government to help the situation. They recently made public imminent disruptions in flight operations, including cancellations and avoidable delays across airports. One of the nation's oldest airlines, Aero Contractors, ceased operations last week owing to its inability to remain in business amid prevailing operational conditions. Another airline, Dana Air, had its license revoked by the Civil Aviation Authorities for Operational Deficiencies. Lara Folayo, TVC News, Abuja. We made seizures what a total duty paid value of seven billion four hundred and thirty two million. Rendering his performance profile between January and June 2022, the Strike Force Team Coordinator, Mohamed Yusuf, states that for as many seizures that are intercepted and destroyed, the economy is affected and scarce foreign exchange are lost. He reveals that between January and June, seizures comprising 8,000 bags of 50 kg foreign parboiled rice, an equivalent of 13 trucks, thousands of pieces of used tires, base of used clothes and textiles, shoes, containers of tramadol and codeine syrup, among other prohibited items, valued at 7.4 billion naira, were intercepted around the border areas. We are losing forex because our hard earned forex is being utilized to bring in these goods. If we can build our, we, we, can, we can encourage our local industries with time, continuously, these things will be okay. Before now, when the whole thing about rice came on board, of course, nobody really liked this rice. It, was, it had a lot of stones and all over. But as time goes on, with constant, you know, uh, research, we now have good rice. With our population, we can now farm a lot and even export to other African countries. Nigeria has the population. We have all it takes. In the month of April, Showing a chart highlighting his revenue generation profile for the first half of the year, he knows that through his interventions, the Strike Force team was able to recover more than 3.1 billion naira from issuance of demand notices within the period under review. This was done sequel to our discoveries of short payment of duties within the period of six months. This amount will have been lost but for our vigilance and uncompromising disposition in the discharge of our duties. When compared to what we have collected, this shows an increase of 1 billion 330, 332 million 242,208 naira representing about 73% increase. Underscoring the need for the trading public to be guided by the import and export prohibition list and guidelines, he warns that ignorance of the law is not an excuse. Ifunanya Eze, TVC News, Lagos. And now it's about a time where we bring you the feature on the show today as we take a look at the growing popularity of citizenship and residency permits by investment programs and what is fueling this growing trend. We'll be back with much more details after this short break. Then go anywhere. Many thanks for still staying with us. Let's now deal with the crux of today's discourse as we analyze the service sector uh, that to some has been described as a novelty due to its exclusive nature. Citizenship by investment and residency by investment programs are government investment schemes that allow foreign investors to obtain either citizenship or residency status in other economically viable countries in exchange for an investment into the country of interest. 
Due to the booming popularity of second citizens and residency permits, the industry grew about 637% to a value of $21.4 billion just last year from the $2.9 billion which was recorded in 2011. Now we see a greater pool of Nigerians and other Africans tapping into this pool of acquiring second citizenships. Well, joining me now virtually to discuss the trends and what the market also portends in the common future, I have Zuberu Kadari, the country manager for Nigeria, that's Rift Trust. Thank you very much for joining us on the show today. Thank you, David. I'm happy to be here. Well, let's now start our conversation with the wave and quest for second citizenship and the boom of firms designing, developing and implementing investor programs for residents and also citizenship. How would you describe this market? Now, for some, it's a novelty. However, the bigger question is, why are more Nigerians and Africans in general seeking second citizenships and why is this the way to go in achieving greater freedom to travel and asset optimization? From my work experience, what I can tell you is we are simply seeing the human response to wanting to be better, do better, and make their impacts and outcomes better. Uh, one of the major reasons that is driving this is a lot of people are realizing the limitations that they have because of the place of their birth. I mean, you choose the clothes you wear, you choose the house you live in, you choose the car you drive but none of us chooses the place of our best. It is something that we are bestowed on in life, but to a large extent, we are faced with the burden of bearing whatever limitation that place of breath has for the rest of our lives, except we decide to do something about it, which is what a lot of people, especially Africans are coming to relate to right now, that their place of birth puts them in certain limitations when it comes to things like passport ranking, visa free access, taking advantage of global opportunities, granting them privileges in global access. This limitation is why a lot of people today are considering a second citizenship or an alternative residency just to be able to improve their quality of life. I will tell you, especially since the pandemic, a lot of people have seen that limitation and now want to be actively involved in improving their bottom line. That's majorly why. Okay, now, due to this uh, growing popularity of second citizens and the residency permits, we've also seen, we've seen quite an astronomical uh, percentage increase, talking about 637% in terms of value. Looking at it, it's been pegged at $21.4 billion just last year. The prospect is even higher for the year 2022 and beyond. What are your projections of how the market will likely grow this year and also come next year as a set sites and projections and forecasts beyond this current uh, post-COVID era and also the Russia-Ukraine crisis and in preparation even for the next global disruption? Yes, to a large extent, like I said earlier, the awareness is there. Um, to explain it to you in a way that is easy for the mind to understand is the most valuable capital in the 21st century right now, especially post-COVID, is global assets. People are looking for better quality of life, security, and wanting to be in a place where they ensure that they are ensuring their future and it is better. So yes, this industry is definitely going to see some quantum leaps and upward surge because more people are realizing that they can harness better privileges and opportunities if they simply just take advantage of alternative citizenship, which is why you can see the mig migratory journeys happening a lot. People are moving to other economies because they want to also play in those economies. But beyond that, more people are taking advantage of the fact that the world is becoming a global village and they want global access to be able to assess investments, quality of life and all of that, especially around investment. For example, a lot of the quiet clients who come in for meetings with us are not primarily looking for an opportunity to relocate, but they just want to have global access for things like technical partnerships. They want to be able to travel freely to other economies where they can harness opportunities that they can even bring back to their local economy and make a difference. So all this is informing the drive for this industry. And that's what's driving the momentum that you are seeing. People wanting to obtain a second citizenship or residency. 
And also one of the clearest points that we have to take a look at is the fact that the acquisition of our citizenship and residency permits through investment programs have a really clear and small audience, that is the elite and high net worth individuals. We understand some services thrive on this exclusivity, but with about 22% of Africa's working age population now starting new businesses, the reality remains that there's limited access to international uh, capital and the lack of global mobility of African entrepreneurs and this continues to uh, constrain how they perform. Do you think now that there will be a time where we would see such exclusive services be much more inclusive for entrepreneurs and working class young men and women with their sights focused on maximizing the opportunities beyond their shore where they operate? In different markets, it means different things to different people. Um, in America, a high net worth individual is somebody who earns upwards of $922,000. Whilst in the Middle East, that person will pass as somebody who earns upwards of $400,000. In Africa, averagely, a high net worth individual is anyone who earns upwards of $200,000. So it's a relative term and people need to understand. But from the work we do, we will tell you statistically that we get more applications from people who fall into the middle class or the upwardly mobile category. Let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, the average startup program for a sitting by investment program is $100,000. We have people who come in and their total net worth in terms of money is about $200,000. And they are willing to put in half of that into a citizenship program. Reason is because they are chasing opportunities. Their motivations are things like security, global mobility, investment, leisure, lifestyle, education, entertainment, and all of that. And they realize that to assess global opportunities, they need to make that significant investment now to be able to get those privileges, those house accesses, those endowments. So saying it is a high net worth product can be very interesting because people think when you say high net worth, you're talking to people who have millions of dollars in asset. No, the fact says a lot more middle-class people are the ones driving the industry because they understand the speed it gives them, the privilege, the access. So just to create that misconception, uh, clear that misconception that it is a high, it's for high net worth individual. In Africa, averagely $200,000 is a high net worth price tag for a HNI. So just want to clarify that and say, we get more inquiries, mm -hmm. we get more signups of people in that price point compared to the people in the million dollar ranges. Yes, we do have the million dollar ranging clients who come in, make inquiries and do sign up for these programs, but it's a misconception and truly, truly needs to be corrected. What drives the industry is the client motivation. And I just mentioned a few of those motivations. And I'm moving the conversation a little bit deeper. How critical would you now say it is to have uh, simplified processes of legally obtaining a second citizenship or residency permit and then the offering of a comprehensive service from the pre-application stage to post-landing? Really, a hand-holding process is critical just to ensure that we have to get things right, wouldn't you say? Yes. And I, I, and I would say this is where the citizen by investment advisory firms are your are a go-to for support. And we happen to be one of the largest brands in the world. We've done this for over a decade and we have successfully helped people go through that process. And today they are smiling. So to help you appreciate the process, first thing you need to understand is that it's a bespoke service. The client motivation varies across different people. At our organization, Brief Trust, we like to say we are here to help the client smile. And SMILE is an acronym that means security, um, mo mo uh, mobility, investment, um, leisure and lifestyle, and then education and entertainment. Reason is because these are the areas from the last decade we found that is a big motivation for clients who are looking for a second citizenship or a second residency because they want to better their bottom line or their quality of life. Now, the process starts with sitting down with the client to first understand what is your short, medium, and long-term goal? What are you trying to achieve? What are you willing to invest? This is where a citizen by investment advisory firm like ours would help you guide the client, that guide the client to find that end goal and define it clearly. Now, when that is defined, 
It informs on the kind of program the client should consider. Should it be a citizenship program or a residency by investment program? Then which of the countries offer the best incentive for the client's ultimate target? Some clients want visa-free access to certain countries because those countries are very important to their business bottom line. Why some clients just want to have freedom of global access. Some countries will come with that perks and some won't. Understanding their documentation processes, because these are reputation, uh, a citizen investment program is a reputation program. It is designed for people who have a good reputation and can also improve the economic bottom line of those countries, whilst also building bilateral, bilateral extensions in terms of being able to also reciprocate and repatriate value from those countries to their host home countries, which is why it's a dual or a multi-citizenship program. So to a large extent, having is an advisory firm like ours guide you through those process, help you through the process, make it seamless, and giving you that delivery in record time is what is informing the need for an advisory firm like ours. And now finally, as a player in the industry, what's your projection for your business and then the service expansion reach you hope to bring to the fore. Your firm has been in Nigeria for about uh, a year now, aside other international operations. What are the prospects for you? Rift Trust is a very award leading group. We're in 22 countries currently and counting, and we are still opening more countries, seriously penetrating Africa. Our core ethos is that we are brand builders. We are build, we are bridge builders rather. We are building a bridge. Uh, our business has two sides. There is the uh, client um, service side of our business where we help our clients obtain second citizenship, but we also provide government advisory service. I mean, in Nigeria, we're just one year here in Nigeria. And during our one year anniversary, we brought the Deputy Prime Minister of St. Lucia here, had exchanges with government officials who are uh, local government officials and Nigerian um, uh, private sector people looking at opportunities to create bilateral extensions, improve relationships. That is at the core of what um, Rift Trust and the Latitude Group is about. We are about building bridges, bridges for the client who wants to obtain a second citizenship to increase their bottom line, Bridges for the governments who want to increase or improve their bilateral relationships so they can do more and gain more for their citizens in exchanges. Basically, that is what drives our value and our vision. We personally believe that nobody should be limited by the identity that they currently carry based on their citizenship they can explore other opportunities. And that's what you're gonna see happening. We're gonna keep going to more countries. Even in Nigeria, we're looking to extend to places like Abuja, Kano, Port Harcourt, bringing the value of building bridges to everyone who sees the value for that, and then creating a platform that causes that seamless exchange and transfer of value to happen. The dynamics of the future, obtaining a second citizenship or residency, is to a large extent an insurance policy. None of us saw COVID coming, for example, but we've had to live with the burden that COVID creates. So it is important that prospective clients consider the fact that giving themselves options helps them prepare better for the future, not just for themselves, but for their children, because they also, on their words, parents, siblings, who get to enjoy a lot of benefits of these programs. Now, creating that insurance is a function of when you decide to put value on it. And I would recommend you put value on it now because nobody knows the dynamics of tomorrow. There's, there's so much acts of God going on in the last two years that has making, that's making people reconsider their existing status. So I want to encourage everyone out there. You should consider adding a second citizenship to your existing citizenship so you can take advantage of global access and things like improved security, global mobility, investments, leisure, lifestyle, entertainment, education. Bottom line is it gives you access to improve your life. So take advantage of this and let's see how we can. We can partner and build something together. Thank you so much for your time on the show. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. And we keep our fingers crossed to see how big the market really grows. Thank you. But just before we go now, here are graphic details of the telecoms data Active Voice and Internet per State port in and tariff information for the first quarter of this year as prepared by the National Bureau of Statistics.
On that note, that's it in this edition of Business Week. Many thanks for watching so far. Do enjoy the rest of your weekend. I'm David Alabi. Bye for now.